Okay. Welcome, everyone. Um, we, we, David, I was all like in a twitch last time about a quorum. What, should I shut up? Looks fine to me. Looks fine. We're good. <laughs> <laughs> We're set. So that was, yes. That's what they've been saying for a long time. Yeah. Well, no, we need more than that. Um, and we, we have. I think we have. I don't know how many people are on. We're, Three, what, 15? 15, so we need eight. Is that a good thing? All right, so eight. I'm... Yeah, we got it. We got it. We got it. Okay, we're set. Um, so welcome. Let's start with introductions, because we are filming, of course. Um, and I guess name and affiliation and pronouns and so on. And Gary, why don't you start? We'll just go around. Sure. I'm Lieutenant Gary Scott with the Vermont State Police, uh, representing Commissioner Anderson. I'm Monica Weaver with the Vermont Department of Corrections, and I'm representing Commissioner Menard. I'm Ken Schatz, Commissioner of the Department for Children and Families. Jeff Jones, I guess uh, at large. <laughs> Rebecca Turner here representing the Defender General of the Office of the Defender General. Eitan Nasred Longo, Chair, he and him. Karen Richards, I'm the guest, um, uh, Human Rights Commission, she and her. Sheila Linton, she and her at large, um, Root Social Justice Center. Um, David Chair with the Attorney General's Office, he and him. Great. Um, oh, I got that backwards. I just noticed that. Announcements should come next before the approval of minutes. I'm sorry. I, and, or, and we're going to put something else in there, too, that Sheila has just asked for. Um, just so you know, Monica's here, at least it's not. Um, James Pepper cannot be here as well, and he wants to, um, just so you know, as an agenda item for next meeting, do, he has some comments he would like to make about the, um, the reading that we were, we've all been working on. The, um, he's got some ideas for that around uh, how to reduce bias in, on the prosecutorial end of things. So that'll be next time. Judge Grierson cannot make it, and Major Jonas can't make it. So that's, that's the list at this moment. I may have, you know, there may be more emails coming in. Because <laughs> some of these were like in the last 20 minutes, so it, it's a little hard to keep up. So, Ethan, are, are we, um, I, know, I know next meeting is on the um, agenda for later, but maybe we can talk about that. We'll, I just want to have a conversation just because the Commissioner Menard will have ongoing conflicts on Tuesdays. Oh, okay, great, of course. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, Sheila, do you want to yeah, go sure. for it? So I'm, I wasn't here the last time, so I'm not sure, but I don't think I saw it in the minutes. But what I would like, um, I asked Aton if we could do just a grounding exercise to bring us into the space today. And I thought that what I would really like to do is that I would really like to do that by giving a moment of a moment of acting out for Kaya Morris. And I think that everybody around the table knows who Kaya Morris is. She was um, a state representative here in Vermont, representing Bennington Counties. Her, she is or was the only black individual who sat in the Vermont legislature. She's been under attack, underneath threats for her life, with her family and her livelihood, both professionally and personally. And um, whether you know her or not, are connected to this issue or not, I ask you to be outraged with me. And I ask you to act out. And so instead of a moment of silence, what I would like to do is to go around the room and for everybody to act out how they're feeling about that. How they're feeling about what Kaya is experiencing and so many other people of color around the state and what exactly are we going to do about it? Not only what are we going to do about it collectively as a group here on this panel, professionally within the work that we do and individuals as the human beings that we are in our collective struggle and liberation for racial justice. So, I will start. Um, I'm in solidarity. I'm outraged, and I'm troubled by the silence of our state and our community on this issue. 
Um, I am also outraged. I'm angry. Um, I feel like um, this this is a direct interference with our democratic process, and that we need to stand up against this kind of hate. And I completely understand where Kai is coming from in terms of withdrawing from her race, but I think that it, um, to, to some extent, it emboldens the people who engaged in this behavior to um, direct other people to engage in the same way. And I think that that is something that we have to be very strong about and we have to really stand up. I just, I actually felt sad. I, the anger, I don't know where it's gone. I just felt sad. And I felt very defeated. I'm tired of discourse getting to this point. It's been happening a lot in the country. Um, and I finally picked myself up and said, what I'm going to do in the sense of within the reach of these arms, it will not be this way, um, is do the best job I can with this panel. Because I don't know who those people are, I can't do anything with them. And this is what I can do. And it's not direct, and it's not perfect, but it's what I can do. And uh, I will show solidarity that way. When it's soused, it's sad, and everything that everyone has expressed so far, I share that. Uh, having this hit close to home, I, I, I particularly relate to um, Karen Richards' points, which is I hope that, um, you know, the discourse around why this is, you know, all the events and why, why it was wrong and what brought about it, and also to inspire more people to stand up and run for office and do what they can in their own individual capacity as is appropriate. And I want to tell them, which is that it sort of reaffirms my commitment to fighting this the way that I can learn and bring in the awareness of these issues. Um, the age of my anger probably should not be felt. So I also feel angry, frustrated, sad, all those things that people have already said. And I think that there's also a sense of um, uh, overwhelmed and feeling that uh, appreciate the point of being raised about how, do, uh, how does one take leadership or who should take leadership to continue sort of expressing that outrage and trying to uh, make change. And I don't have an answer for that but I think that it's uh, the kind of thing that's on my mind right now. Yeah, yeah I also uh, share the sentiments that all of you have. I think it's a real loss for the state that she mm -hmm. will no longer be serving in the legislature, although I know that she'll continue you know, as a person fighting for the causes that we're all trying to work towards. And I think in terms of this panel, just you know, doing the work that we're doing to keep shedding light on the topics and talking about them, um, trying to do our best to work through them, is uh, how I feel like I can contribute. Mm -hmm. I think we echo a lot of those sentiments. It's, it's frustrating and you want to continue to come to the table and see things like that happen. It's like you know, many steps backwards, so how do we keep trying to move this sort of forward and make progress? And it's, it's a frustrating process, so mm -hmm. it's upsetting to see things like that happen. I largely agree with the sentiments that have been expressed. Very, I feel very angry and, and frustrated, and uh, it's it's frustrating and sad to see people like that uh, get what they will view as a victory. And that's not to say that Kaya didn't make the choice that she that was right for her. I respect that, but uh, um, it's just tragic that these things are happening. Um, and for me, I work with her pretty closely on the Judiciary Committee in the State House, and she was just a really um, great person to work with and was um, really uh, effective and I'm, I'm going to miss her presence there. It's, it's a real loss for the state that she isn't going to be there. Um, so that 
compounds my frustration on this. And, and uh, you know, I think just rededicating ourselves to what we're doing here. Obviously, our, our office is working on that specific case, but we need to do more, much more systematically um, to make these things better. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. I really appreciate you putting that into the yeah. space. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Uh, pull myself together here. Uh, <laughs> minutes. Approval of the minutes. Are there any uh, from the last meeting? Those were sent out. Are there any points that need to be made about those minutes? Things that people felt were left out, not... Um, fully explained, I guess. I just like to say kudos to who wrote the minutes last time? That was me last time. Last time. Oh you did. So <laughs> I think next a lot of reflection of um, <laughs> what would Sheila say? So thanks for that. Uh, um, and reflecting that in the minutes. That was nice to see my voice in the room, um, even though I was in present, physically present. So thank you. Anything, or would someone like to make a motion to approve and second it and all that? Motion to approve. And a seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? All abstentions. Motions pass, minutes are approved. Thank you. Um, as they stand. So there we are. Um, David, you can. Just take them from your computer and give them to your wizard people and they can do their wizard thing. Sounds good. And, okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, all right. Now, Karen Richards, not going to spend any more time on announcements. I'm just going to go right on in. We all know who she is. I'm so grateful that you can come back because we really... It was interesting. Everybody just sort of came to this point at the meeting um, where it, there was no motion, <coughs> there was no seconding, there was none of that. But it was really clear that everybody got to this moment of sort of saying, why reinvent the wheel? Why not make things more robust with organizations that already exist? And then it was like, we need to have you back. And we need to have you back before you go off to I don't know, Reykjavik or wherever it is you're <laughs> I'm going to be in Vermont. Okay. <laughs> so, um, you were going to, you had some issues you wanted to bring up in, that kind of dovetailed with what you sent out to us. Right. So, um, what I actually did was I brought in our, what, our oh. close to our. Um, Absolutely. Right. Okay. What are close to our um, final statistics there for this fiscal year? There may be some changes um, to that um, because I may have like messed up when I was getting the data out of the database. Not my high point skill level. Anyway, so um, what I wanted to do was just kind of walk you through um, some of this information to, to as a preview to. Um, my remarks in um, response. So um, the first, or the second page actually, um, lists the three areas where we um, have jurisdiction and then gives you the various categories of protection that exist under each of those areas. Mm -hmm. um, and so the Attorney General's office would have those same uh, responsibilities with regard to private employment. So this is just state government employment for the Human Rights Commission. Um, the next page shows you um, about how many, not about, um, how many um, calls we, oh, I'm sorry, that closed it. I lost something here. Oh. Hmm. You missed okay, it. I cut and pasted something out of there. Okay, I'm very sorry. Anyway, the call, the number of calls that we get was the next thing that was on here, um, and we had about um, eight hundred twenty-six. Eight hundred twenty-six. Missing numbers. Missing the odd number pages. Yes, missing pages three and five. Oh. 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 So I you're the only them. one that has the three. Oh. 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 <laughs> like. <laughs> What's wrong right. with that? <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, I also have 
issues with the proofreading. <laughs> out, so. Would you like this copy? <laughs> yeah, yeah, let me have that. Yeah. <laughs> and give me a copy. I will copy. send you okay. one of my email that you can send. And then I'll send it out to every yeah. good page. So every other page I will tell you about. <laughs> 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 it's a really interesting technique. I'm going to share the responsibility. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad somebody else does this. <laughs> All right, so for calls and referrals, last year we had about 826 calls over the course of the fiscal year, um, and they're pretty consistent across quarters, so around 200 calls or two to 300 calls, depending. Um, most of them are non-jurisdictional calls, which means they're not um, calling about a complaint that meets our um, requirements for a discrimination complaint, but they may have a landlord-tenant problem, or they may have a problem where they think it's discrimination, but it's about smoking or something that's not a protected status. And so we do our best to refer those folks um, where they need to go, and a lot of them are private employees calling that need to go to the Attorney General's office, so we do that. Um, <clears throat> the website analysis showed that um, we had a total of um, 23,000 page views and 9,484 sessions with 6,525 users, um, and that's 84% new users to the site, so it's not um, all the same people coming back all the time, so the site is getting um, increased um, traction, I guess. Um, and then in terms of the complaints accepted, you can see about what the numbers are. I gave you the fiscal year 17 and the fiscal year 18. Um, so the housing cases are slightly down this year. Everything else is slightly up. Um, and um, the total is up slightly from last year as well. Um, and it shows you um, how cases are disposed of, um, what the closures are. So um, about 28% are closed, I think, with conciliation. Um, these are hard to see because they're not in color. Um, and 28% are um, admin hearing, and about half of 44% are closed by conciliation efforts. So close to half of that. Administrative dismissals um, are either withdrawals with settlement, um, that we close them for non-cooperation of the complaining party, or if there's no prima facie case, or if the complaint's not returned. And there you can see that about 65% are cases where the complaint is not returned. So it would be really interesting to know more about what what that statistic is and what it means because clearly there's a lot of complaints going out where people don't um, get them back to us and I think um, experience shows that the highest area that that happens in is housing and I'm not sure why that is but it's one of the areas that we would really like to capture more cases in so um, and then complaints brought before the hearing, uh, the commission for hearing, um, there were a total of 17 this past year, which is probably the highest number we've ever had go to hearing in a year. Um, and there were seven that were reasonable grounds and ten that were no reasonable grounds. So, and it's usually pretty close to a 50 50 split. Um, the next page shows um, yeah, those categories <laughs> by com t complaint type and the number, total number. Um, and it's also reflected in the protected status by fiscal year chart on the next page. I cap tried to capture the major categories and you can see that um, disability um, complaints remain pretty constant and consistent. They're off by like one or two cases a year mm -hmm. um, in number. And then um, race, um, color, national origin were spiked last year. We had twice as many cases in those areas, which doesn't really surprise me given what's going on nationally. Um, and then the sex, sexual orientation, those all remain fairly um, steady as well. And then uh, the retaliation complaints spiked mm. this year. And those tend to be in the employment area, unfortunately, mm. where you know, the employee um, makes an underlying complaint and then suffers some sort of adverse employment action afterwards. Um, <clears throat> and then the next thing shows you the types of relief that we're getting in cases, both um, relief for the complainants um, 
and mon monetary relief, non-monetary relief, and in public interest relief that the Human Rights Commission um, gathers. And this past year, we collected around four hundred and eleven thousand dollars in damages for people um, in settlements. Um, four hundred and eleven thousand um, dollars. So, and that. Um, that will vary from year to year. Public accommodations are usually not that high. It's usually the employment cases that generate the most money, but for, for some reason this year, the um, public accommodations cases had high settlement uh, values. Um, and then outreach and training. We did 37 total training events, which is down from what we um, did last year significantly, and trained around 874 people. Last year, we trained around 2,000 people. Um, so those numbers dropped just in part from staffing issues and um, uh, staff coverage and that sort of thing. Is it okay to ask you questions sure, along sure, the way? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, no, I'm just What's rattling on. Go ahead. Um, so those trainings, do you, are those trainings asked of or those trainings you just give, go around and give? Or are they trainings that people solicit you for? They're both. Um, and so there's three types of training that we do. One is um, we will often, as you'll see in the, if you have the page, um, a lot of times the public interest relief requires training for um, the entity or the individuals and so that we, we consider that to be responsive training that we're doing um, because you need to learn how not to do this again basically. Um, then we have particularly in the housing area um, large housing providers who reach out to us almost on an annual basis to ask us to come and do fair housing training for their staff so we will go and do that. Um, and the implicit bias training that I've been doing has also been pretty much word of mouth. Um, I do it one place and then I usually get two or three calls after that to please come and do it somewhere else. And so um, that's how it, most of it happens is um, people calling us or we us doing it to them, essentially. As part of and is there a cost associated? Um, we charge um, usually a nominal amount um, just to cover the costs. Um, some of it is a penalty to the respondent if they've been found to have violated the law. Um, but mostly it's a nominal amount just to cover the cost of our transportation and copies and that sort of thing. All right, and then um, the last um, couple pages show the summary of the reasonable grounds cases that we got um, and what those settlements were, um, and then the litigation that we um, were involved in in the past year. So that's. Do <laughs> a real one. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know you've just been going on, but and giving us all this. But did you want to address your comments on the sheet that we sent to you? Sure, sure. As well, yes. at this point. Yeah, okay. that's if that was me. Yeah, I, I, everybody on with that since we read it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So um, I wanted to give you some idea of um, what the case stats are, so you would have a little bit of idea of. Um, how that works within our structure. So um, what I am finding as, um, you know, as you leave a job and um, get ready to leave a job, you're like looking at um, what are the things that could be done better here that would work better um, for everyone. And what I realize as we're putting together the job, my job description and putting it out there to get applicants that um, the job is not doable by a single human being. I mean, literally, it is like everything from, you know, doing the legislature to litigation to education and outreach to um, policy work and everything else in between, right? Like one person is charged with that and then there's three investigators and there's a, an executive staff assistant and that is us. Um, and we're trying to cover the whole state with that. And so what I really um, started thinking about was if we had more resources and we were talking about this internally as well, what would that look like and what would be the best option for um, maximizing all of the staff. And so my 
Um, my conception of that, and this could change with a new director coming in who may have a different conception, um, but my conception of it would be to separate the legal counsel from the um, executive director so that you have somebody who can concentrate on litigation and you have somebody, you don't have a director who's going, okay, am I going to be able to really manage this lit complex litigation while I'm trying to handle the legislature and trying to supervise staff and trying to do all the administrative work and trying to do all you, because that factors into how robust a response you can give and then of course you can't be a paper tiger if you're not going to put your money where your mouth is, if you're not going to um, sue and you're not going to pursue the matter, then the, the word gets out about that and you become, you know, useless. And so it's really important to be able to follow that up and, and I think having a dedicated legal counsel would really help with that. They could also work on the conciliation efforts, they could um, do legislative research, they could do a lot of things that would take those things off of the executive director's plate so that the executive director could concentrate on policy and strategic planning and how to move forward with issues like how do we start a conversation about racism in the state of Vermont that's you know going to be a robust one that can start to address this issue instead of just like feeling like we're on a treadmill all the time. So the, and then the other piece of that that I thought would be really important would be um, somebody who could do education and outreach so that we would have somebody on the ground who could be out in the communities who could be wanting to do community forums, who could be organizing those for the executive director, who could be getting, um, keeping up our website and making it more robust, um, doing more um, on our newsletters, uh, doing the, um, getting our Facebook page up and really active and getting more active on social media. So there's a lot of things that somebody in that position could also do that would really help to move the agency forward. So that's sort of my conception of um, what would help the most in terms of um, adding resources to the human rights. So that was mostly what my um, response here was, was the um, kind of hopefully rationale around um, why that makes sense to me. And what's that people breakdown in those areas, as you mentioned that? The people breakdown in terms of... Yeah, so I, I would love to hear from an asset space of what would be great for you to be successful. And I think we often talk about it like, oh, if I could just get this rather than what you really deserve and need. So how many people in those various positions? I know that you mentioned a number before when you came before, but I'm wondering, um, have you reassessed as the same number or is that a different number? How many bodies is right. that? I think, it's, I think it's two bodies. Um, you could also try to pursue another investigator position, but I think that... Um, with a better outreach program, education outreach program, you will hopefully have more complaints, jurisdictional complaints coming in, um, which might necessitate another investigator, but I wonder if it's pushing too much to try to get that investigator in before you actually have the cases coming in the door, or whether it makes sense to just, if you're gonna go for it, just go for it. That's and, where I was going. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are you saying that, am I understanding you right, that, that, that um, you have the adequate number of investigators to handle the current the current caseload. Case yeah. Case yeah, I see. I you, you you feel I'm currently and you feel that way, and do your investigators feel that way? Do they feel like their caseload is manageable? I I believe they do. I have a quick question. I saw somewhere I can't remember if it was recently in the legislative bodies or not, but it looked. I don't know if it was the mental health or the opiate issue that they're thinking of providing more resources to your department to through mm -hmm. some funds that are just coming in. I think it was through mental health, the, the, but I wasn't sure. I, I, I don't think it would be the Human Rights Commission. I, no, I thought I heard, heard that. I was just curious how that would, other if other if you know of other things coming your way that are outside of what we're trying to do. No. Okay. I have to see if I can find that, but I remember seeing something. 
So, I'm sorry, I might be beating a dead horse, but you think that you only need two to three more positions in the Human Rights Commission to be your most successful for our state? Well, more successful, I'm not sure I would say most successful. So, I mean, with that number, is, is that number low because you're thinking in that mindset of that budget, or is it low because you really think, because what, what I've heard is that you've held a lot of weight, and even breaking that up into two positions would be what realistically is what is needed already. So therefore, I'm just wondering if, not to sell ourselves short, that to be realistic about what our needs are and to prioritize those needs and to reflect those. And I feel like if we are gonna, if we're going, if those needs relate to money, which in this case it does, that, that we need to prioritize that as a budget and we need to figure out how to raise that and not like cut ourselves short because there isn't the money there. We need to do the work around the table and make the money be there so that it can be successful, so we can be effective. So I just, if it's not three people and it's five, then I just want to hear, yeah. you know, we really need five. Or we really need, you know, what, 10, to be honest with you, because I've been doing this for whatever, and Robert was doing it for whatever, and this is the consensus. And I would also love to hear just a little bit more of how much you've talked to your colleagues in terms of how they actually feel and making sure that um, it's also coming from them because they're on the ground of work like you are in your position. And I'm also concerned, too, from my own um, experiences from utilizing the Human Rights Commission numerously, I have some anecdotal answers to the questions that have been thrown out, and I can assure you that people who are trying to access the Human Rights Commission feel as though there are not enough investigators for whatever reason, or not attained to, or given the time that they need. Um, whether that's valid or not, I don't know, but I will say that that, amongst the communities that I've worked with, have felt like, wow, they're too busy, there's no jurors, there's always something to the reason why they don't file that second complaint, why they feel like it's gonna get lost. And so i rather eliminate that from the community saying like there's just not enough resources there for them to do our jobs well, which most of us around the table are talking about in the spheres that we work in, and just like be realistic about what we need to do. And maybe that doesn't change your answer, but if it does. <laughs> From my understanding, it sounds like you need a litigator and a training mm -hmm. person. Um, I mean, if that's what you say you need, that's what you say you need. I mean, if you need something more later, then great. But, I'm, but right now, I mean, you were saying that those are at least two positions that you need, if not more, if you get more demand. Is that correct? Well, that was my question. Is it if you get more demand, or even ideally right now, with your current situation, without more demands, right. Um, I think you could, um, I guess I, having been in state government, one tends to uh, try not to get ahead of myself. So, um, it's a gentle push back. Gentle. Very gentle. Um, it's sort of, um, it's like, for me, it's like a settlement negotiation, right? Where you go know for too much money at the outset and they just walk away from the table because they're not going to like talk to you because they think you're crazy, right? Um, so I wonder if you... I'm trying to be realistic in the sense of having the ask be realistic enough that they might actually um, not walk away from the table saying, are you crazy, like, we're not going to double the size of the Human Rights Commission, it's not happening, um, go home, <laughs> go back to your quarters and mm -hmm. stay there. Um, but, you know, I don't know. I don't know what the, I think there's, um, there is a collective feeling that um, this is a civil rights is an area where the federal government is walking backwards about as fast as they can walk, and um, if not running the other direction. <laughs> and um, you know, I think it's it's going to be up to the states to really step up and pick up the slack. And so, to that extent, um, you know, this is kind of a good time to be yeah. having this discussion yes. because I think it, it is a, it's a relevant. It is relevant, and I would just say, 
negotiation from a criminal defense perspective is that you owe it. I can ask for whatever I want because ultimately it is usually in the state's best interest not to go to trial either, you know, for whatever their reasons. So if our, our state is at a point where we, like, there's a clear consensus, which I think at, you know, by the fact that this panel was created and another committee was created as well, like, it's on everybody's mind and now might be the time to go in with the high ask and not go in with the reasonable ask yes. and then get local, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did we, did, and I'm sorry to have missed last week, last month, when, when it seems like from the minutes that the focus was recognized recognition of the group that H, HRC should be the centralized place in state government for all complaints related to criminal and juvenile justice system. Is that right? For most complaints or... A lot of, uh, because other agencies, and like, for instance, state police, right? I mean, that they've already got um, an internal... You got that thing. Yeah. And the attorneys have uh, a separate professional responsibility. Right. Uh, there's overlap at least. Okay, so then back to that. Your page two of the handout that I think we all got. Um, <laughs> <laughs> lucky you. Really is the three columns of jurisdiction of HRC, right? right? And so what do you see as the most relevant for our issues in terms of, of where the complaints come in from our perspective on the criminal legal justice system, the courts, the police, uh, prosecutors, uh, defense attorneys, right? The staff supporting all of them. Um, Within this, would it be the public accommodation? Right, so right. any place not... that offers goods and services to the public, including our correctional system, um, is a place of public accommodation. So we get complaints from people within the corrections, mm -hmm. we get complaints from people about the police, we get complaints mm -hmm. um, about the judiciary. Um, some of those are um, more appropriate for judicial misconduct. Mm -hmm. um, conversations and a lot of times it's just I, I disagree with the judge and so you know and back to the numbers and fielding oh, so no, we, we didn't talk about DCF I, I, where were okay. DCF we did accommodate public accommodations for DCF as well right or yes. do you get yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right? sure. yeah, yeah. Uh, and I guess then the question is back to numbers and thinking big and trying to support it seems like we don't have to, if you don't think the numbers are there yet to support more than two and it's within this public accommodations how do we get the numbers up? Are we? Are you? Are you thinking that there's an underreporting of whether the issues are in corrections or police? Like that's back to um, trying to get the word out. Um, how do we get a more accurate assessment of what are the real numbers? I think that um, the part of the problem is that a lot of people don't even know we exist. I think that's a huge problem, which would be a reason to have more outreach out there. Um, when I go out and talk to groups, I'll say, how many of you have ever heard of the Human Rights Commission? Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, not that many people have, because the agency, <coughs> for whatever reason, has not, I mean, we get a decent amount of press, we get a decent amount of reporting on our work, but um, for whatever reason, that doesn't resonate with people in a way that makes them think this is the place I go for X, Y, or Z. So, I do think if there was a, a robust education and outreach campaign that we would start to get more complaints in, for sure. And then it would, I think we are, I would say we are at capacity with our current investigators in terms of what they can handle. So if we started getting an influx of a lot more cases, we would quickly be pretty overwhelmed. Who is your uh, model out there? I'm sorry, no, I'm jumping okay. in. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm wait to sure you Yeah, no, keep going. Uh, is there a model that you see around the country as wow, that would be a wonderful organization or model, practice model, if we could have that here? Well, part of what I've been thinking about and looking at is sort of the ACLU and the way that the ACLU has built up its resources in, in this time of um, money for Lincoln. Um, and, you know, they've added a lot of, they've added policy directors, they have, um, you know, they have their education and outreach person, they have more attorneys, they have like a lot of that kind of build up and, and the work that we're doing is similar on 
slightly different topics. So I look at them and say that that's a potential model for how you would want to structure a larger agency. Um, I think other human rights commissions around the state, uh, around the country, I'm sorry, are um, structured very differently than ours. Ours is one of two. Um, ours in Maine, because we always copy Maine for some reason. Um, <laughs> ours in Maine are these kind of anomalies in which the um, there's this commission that is um, overseeing the executive director who oversees the staff. Whereas in other organizations, you have commissioners who have very different roles. They might be hearing officers, and they're also doing um, administrative agency level hearings, which we don't do in Vermont. So you could do a whole structural change to the Human Rights Commission where instead of people just getting this investigative report that says reasonable grounds or no reasonable grounds and goes to five essentially lay people who vote up or down on that recommendation and then it has to go to court, you could structure an agency where you had administrative hearings and people got a probable cause finding from an investigator and then it went to an administrative hearing where there was evidence presented and witnesses presented and that sort of thing and that would be a whole different structure that you could put in place that um, maybe would be more um, effective. Um, I don't know. And I don't know what the stomach for, you know, that kind of change, but that's the way most states do it. And then their attorney general's offices are often prosecuting attorneys for those cases rather than having in-house counsel, although I think some of in-house counsel as well. Or in-house counsel would review the findings and then go to the AG to prosecute or whatever. So you could you could set up a whole different system, which would then require a whole different um, type of staffing. Thanks. So I, I want to sort of um, think through, maybe out loud, the, the the charge that we were given. So, and I also missed last meeting, so I apologize for that too. But, but you know, the charge is how to institute a public complaint process to address perceived implicit bias across all systems of state government. So, and it may be that the group decided last time to focus on those portions of state government involved in the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. and, and I respect that, but on the other hand, I actually think the Human Rights Commission can be the appropriate body to look at all of state government agencies. And sort of what I want to propose is the idea. I get the I get the approach of uh, the commission proposing that they need an additional litigator and training person. And those make sense to me. But I would put out there that maybe what we want to think about is actually another position that is focused on helping create a public complaint process for all of state government. Because I think this charge is kind of both uh, broader or narrower than your current jurisdiction. So implicit bias goes beyond findings of discrimination, and it might not fit neatly into your current system of, of looking at whether or not uh, there's, uh, you know, uh, the, the charge has been, whether there's reasonable grounds. And I think that the value of having a person dedicated to looking at state government along the lines of um, this charge could be recognizing that certain agencies like public safety, like agency human services bodies and attorneys already have existing systems, but you can still be a clearinghouse. You might not want to duplicate what other entities are doing, but you might want to keep track and make sure that we're all aware of uh, numbers, types of cases, what the resolutions are, because right now you don't know that. I don't know how many cases come through the public safety system, corrections, or attorneys, or for that matter, DCF, and so I see value in the Human Rights Commission being a focal point. So that's kind of my thinking: is that to have uh, to have the recognition that the Human Rights Commission is potentially a place for this to live, mm -hmm. and figure out when it's just gathering information, publicizing that, so we all know what's going on, and making recommendations uh, statewide, but also in appropriate cases going through its own um, consideration of the actual allegations and moving them through a process. So that's kind of what I was thinking about the value of the Human Rights Commission is to really focus on um, issues of uh, a bias, particularly with respect to state agencies. So um, they've created this other um, racial equity advisory panel that's going to be looking at disparities within state government 
Um, and there's going to be an executive director that is charged with that. And the legislature made a conscious decision to not put that in the Human Rights Commission. Um, so um, I don't know yeah. how that would fit with that or how that, you know, how those two, I mean, it, not to say those two pieces yeah. couldn't work together. Yeah. But but they might, and that person's supposed to be liaisoning with the Human Rights Commission, um, whatever that means. <laughs> I never got anyone to quite explain that to me, but um, yeah. It still seems we could ask for that. When you say and ask for that, what's the that? The that being the position that Ken's proposing. It seems like we could still ask for it, and then... I mean, we're advisory, so if we throw this at the legislature and say, by the way, we think this, and they go, well, no, we can say, here's reason why, A, B, C, D, E, so on and so forth. Um, I mean, it sort of comes under your, let's go for the moon. Well, I kind of uh, also suggested similar mm -hmm. to what you were saying about keeping track of the data, and I think your pushback was that a lot of times it goes in the litigation. We don't know because it's confidential and sealed. We don't, in other words, I asked for, how do you get the data to follow up to see what happened? Because without data, it's hard to do anything. Like, it'd be a clearinghouse. And I think you said you already have people that say, well, this belongs to HUD, this belongs here, this belongs there. But then keeping track of what happened, which was to Sheila's point, I think, originally a while back, like, well, what happened? Did they just stop? doing it because they got frustrated or did it go to litigation or what what happened to it and I and I think there was some unknowns of like well maybe we can't collect that data but maybe that position could be mm -hmm. some, like okay we don't want to know the details of the litigation we just want to know if it was solved or just forgotten or dropped so it doesn't really violate client privilege but it just at least you know it either followed through to completion or it just they never showed up and it, they just got tired of it and dropped it or something. I don't know. But I, I think data would be very helpful, even to the new panel. Um, but anyway. I, I agree with what Ken is saying. <clears throat> and my original thought on what you're saying, Chief John Stevens, I, um, I'm, I'm concerned. Yes, I want I want like a central place for all of this to go that's documented as central, that is public access for things that are not highly confidential. So whether they lie in HUD, I then in addition would like to see an independent entity of the entity that's being questioned to be holding that information and be accessible by the public. Just that's just that's what I'm looking for and what I'm talking about the role. So similar to what you're saying, I think it's the same thing. You already have most things that are public unless they go to mediation, arbitrary, all this stuff. But you made a really good point. There was, you talked to, we've been talking about jurisdiction, which a lot of the cases don't fall under your jurisdiction. So my question with that is, do we need to be changing some legislation, some kind of law, some type of thing to raise the bar on from a FASA to even make your agency effective? Because again, coming from the other side of working with people, it's why they don't return it. They know it's not going to go through it, and they don't got time for that. They, they're living their lives, they're about to get kicked out of the house, about to lose their children, they're about to, they, they don't have time. And usually the people who are filing are people who are the most oppressed individuals anyway. They're of color, they're with disabilities, they're on survival mode, and they're without representation. So the knowledge and the time and the energy and the emotional strength that it takes to follow through on something like that, when you've already heard from everybody else in your community that it didn't work, it's, it's, it's not effective. So I'm just, I keep coming back to the jurisdiction thing. I keep coming back to um, um, whether we can really um, make it a separate, whether we can change, you were talking about what changing, you, we could change what you do. I'm interested in what you said. I don't, I don't remember all of what you were saying, but I was interested in that as you were trying to explain that. I said, oh, you could do this, and we could, our, the Human Rights Commission could function like this. Now, once I understand all of what you just said, mm -hmm. I might like that. Mm -hmm. And I would like to n discuss that more, or maybe you put that in writing so I can see it in writing, of how can we change the Human Rights Commission to meet the needs of the people? I mean, this is not brain surgery to me. Like, it's like, we have needs, we have communities that are coming out and saying what their needs are, and we are trying to meet those needs, and so just thinking outside of that box, like, how can we, 
how can we make it effective? And I don't think it's a one-pronged approach. I think we need to change legislature. I mean, I think we need more staff and resources. I think that we need more outreach, but I think it's many pronged. And so I would love to, I would like to move forward in making this organization successful for all the people who need to use it. As well. Um, so uh, the jurisdictional thing, I think, is not a huge um, barrier because it's basically, are you a member of protected class? Did something bad happen to you? And is there some evidence somewhere, something that happened that will tell us that it was related to your protected status? That's all we need. It's a very low bar for a prima facie case. Um, and that's enough to, to file a complaint. Um, we generally, um, once we get the information, and the getting the information may be the problematic piece, because we have a, um, we have forms online that people fill out. Um, we can take information over the phone, but we generally have people fill out the forms if they can. If they can't, then we take the information over the phone. As, once we have that information, we draft the complaint up for them. And we send it to them, and once we've drafted that complaint, we are saying to them, we believe this to be a valid complaint, and you just need to send it back to us. Um, I think some of the barriers to that are um, exactly what you said, people are in crisis and this was on their mind at this moment and the next moment they've got another crisis that they're dealing with and so this falls down below the radar. Um, I think it's also, it may be that the complaints are required to be notarized. I don't know how much of a barrier that is, but that would be an easy fix to say definitely no more notarization, right? Um, you don't need to notarize it. Um, we don't have respondents notarize their responses, which is kind of interesting. Like, mm -hmm. so if they want to lie, mm -hmm. it doesn't really matter. But if the complainant's lying, that's that's a problem. Um, so you know, I I think that that's um, there's some assumptions there about people filing complaints, but whatever. Um, <laughs> so I think that those are there's some potential barriers there, and you know, to the extent that we could simplify our online complaint process and those sorts of things, I think those are things that we could work on that would make that better. Um, the other thing that I think might address some of your concerns and the thing that we've been also toying with the Human Rights Commission and again lacking sort of resources to kind of pursue in any robust manner would be to implement some sort of restorative justice process within the Human Rights Commission that people could access instead of going through a formal complaint process. And that, I think, has a lot of promise for um, being able to address some of these things quicker and in a manner that actually has the potential to provide healing for people instead of just um, you file a complaint and you either get a reasonable grounds finding where you don't and you don't necessarily feel good about the process or what ha what comes out of the other end of it. Um, and so that would be another way of sort of looking at it, like could we implement a restorative process and what would that look like in terms of staffing um, and what would you need to do with that. But I think that holds some promise and there are other um, human rights commissions, particularly in Canada, that have been doing that and I've been in contact with them to find out how they're doing it and what they're doing with it. And so, you know, that holds a lot of promise as well. Hello. Okay. Okay. Just a quick follow-up about the restorative justice idea. Would you, uh, are, do you envision that as part of HRC or is there a possibility that HRC would connect with some already existing restorative justice issues? I think it could be either way. I mean, we had been conceiving it. I think when, when I'm talking to the person that I'm in contact with in the Northwest Territories of, of, of um, <laughs> Canada, um, she, she was talking about um, what they have really done, and they thought they were going to have to just like revamp their entire process and, and change everything from the ground up in order to do this. And what they realized was, that they could, if they just spoke to people differently about the way that they do mediations, for example, and talk to them about a restorative process within what used to be mediation, that more people were willing to access mediation and more people were willing to participate in a process that was described as a restorative process. And so, you know, that also, um, 
and, and so they didn't really have to tweak their process all that much other than to add in like another tool in their toolbox basically mm -hmm. that they were making available to people. But again, you have to have staff who are able to do that or who can do the referrals or who can already set it up. But. So you need an additional person. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're up to 20 more. Well, that was part of what we right. originally began with. And so that's why I was asking, because there are certain ideas that have come up over the last months that I wasn't hearing in those person counts. So I'm glad that this is coming out. I'd like to ask you a quick question. That I know how the legislators think, and you, you do too. You know how that works, right? They want to get things and move them on. I want to make sure we're not overstepping our bounds and getting too far into the weeds. Like you said, one of our charges is just to recommend a central process for complaints, period. Right now we're trying to solve the Human Rights Commission structure. So do we just say <clears throat> our, our avenue to meet this charge is to um, centralize the complaints to the Human Rights Commission and we request that the legislators work with the Human Rights Commission to develop whatever plan they need to make this possible. And then you're working directly with them, because you know how it works. We're going we're gonna to submit this. They're going to pull you in and say, what do you need? That's usually the way it works, because they're going to know we're recommending this. They're going to go to you and say, come in and testify and tell us what you need. And then you're going to have a plan or draft up. You know, they may take a recommendation, but they're going to go to you and you're going to tell them the same thing you're telling us. So I'm looking at this, what our meeting here is a discovery of how do we work together to support you in this endeavor to help you structure it. But I want to make sure we're not overstepping our bounds and then letting you or the new executive director of the Human Rights Commission decide what you need and how you're going to support it instead of us trying to tell you what to do. I, I just want to make sure from you what are you looking from us in this panel? Are you looking for us to help you design that, or just saying, okay, just support me in, in my efforts of trying to restructure and doing whatever I need to do? So I, I want to give you that option and not us to keep telling you how many people you need and all of that. So, um, so I, I, both, I welcome your input into what you all think is important and what could help the Human Rights Commission be better. Um, I welcome that input because that feeds into my the way that I think about it and the you know my evolving thoughts on the process and I'm sure would also um, be that for the new executive director as well. Um, I I do think you're correct. At the end of the day, it's us that is going to be asked like what do you need and, and how do you need it, but I think that the more that we have support coming from groups like this to say, no, you need to do this, um, is, is going to make or break the difference in whether it can actually get done or not. Because if it's just us going in there for an ask and we don't have the support of the community and we don't have support of groups like this, then um, we're unlikely to be successful at all in whatever we might be able to figure out and negotiate. So I mean, appreciate the support of this group in having this discussion and in supporting traditional resources. And how do you sort of envision what we're talking about here of all, like all agencies throwing a complaint into your shop like that? How do you see that, like, do you see that in growing? And how do you, what problems do you kind of see with that happening if all of a sudden all these different agencies are now showing some type of complaint process to you and now you may be sending them back and having to capture that data? And, I guess that grows to another position what we're talking about. Would it be a totally different position outside of what you're thinking about and a whole different division within there? And how does that grow within the, I mean, have you, I don't know if you thought about it at all, but that's kind of, I think what we're saying is there's this complaint place, it needs to be centralized in the state, and now it's gonna land in your arena. Is that a whole different area or does it kind of ebb and flow naturally? I think that the, the question for me would be how would those complaints end up getting funneled there because right now, um, you know, if you have a complaint against an attorney, you complain to the professional conduct board about the attorney. If you have a complaint about a police officer, it goes to internal affairs. Um, so I don't know how you would, you would have to create a system in which those complaints came one place and then went back out again, and I would wonder how efficient that is. 
and whether it just feel whether people just feel like they're being um, jerked around because we get a lot of calls from people who say, oh, um, you know, so, such and such agency told us to call you, and then we say, well, we're not the right agency. It's this agency, and they get angry legitimately because they're the fifth or sixth person they've talked to. Right? And, yeah. <laughs> the time they'll never get back. You know, trying to figure out chain. what to do. Yeah. You know. And it's frustrating for people, and so we tried not to do that. So I would be a little concerned that how you set that up so that that system, I, I could see it as a maybe the entities themselves report the data to mm -hmm. us. So we had, the Vermont State Police had X number of complaints. Um, DCF had X number of complaints. Um, you know, whatever, the judiciary had X number of complaints and that we could collect and compile that information. I could see that, but I would I would hesitate to create a system where things come in and then we just have to refer them back out again just because I think that is not um, helpful to people. It'll so. probably grow as we figure out how many agencies we're going to start really, you know, as we get to sheriffs. And, I mean, think police side of that, it's going to... All those police agencies, right, you know, there's, right, right. there's 80. That's a lot. <laughs> they could all, all of a sudden just keep coming in. So I just. I find myself persuaded by what you were saying, Ken, about. I'm thinking about what you were just saying, Garrett. It's <laughs> sort of going, okay, then we could have that person do this. We could actually get a position, you know, ask for a position for somebody who's coming up with a robust complaint, complaint process to ask those sorts of questions. And maybe in what we forward to the legislature, we would put in something that would look like a proto job description, you know, and say that we would hope that this position would include somebody who would ask, et cetera, et cetera. Just throwing that out there, because I'm thinking of writing. Are we also thinking, though, of um Karen's initial idea of splitting the ED into a new uh, executive director and um, legal counsel as well. So that'd be it, potentially three. Yeah. And an educator. Yeah. Yeah. Education. Right. Yeah. Well, I thought, okay. She I thought has, the education. There was, yeah. there was, I think, the litigator education and then this new thing, new yeah. position in counsel is total three, right? Right. Maybe a more, depending on if you think. There should be more investigators. Or whatever. So I appreciate the points about not overstepping our role. I think that where I look at it, this is what the legislature has said to this panel: help make the state agencies accountable with respect to racial bias. And I think that's appropriate. It makes sense to me. I think the Human Rights Commission is the good place mm -hmm. to do that. I don't. I appreciate the point. I don't think you want to, nor do we want to have duplication or more hoops for people to go through. But that would be part of the charge. Because right. I don't think we as a panel need to go through all those details now. I don't think we mm -hmm. want to reinvent the wheel. But I think that the Human Rights Commission as the focus is makes sense to me and to give them resources to do that makes sense the question about whether or not they want to um, split the director and, and litigator i want to be respectful of their perspective but i don't know that we need to weigh in on that what we want to make sure is that if we're asking the human resources commission to take on the role with respect to state agencies right. they have appropriate resources to do that and give them the charge to figure out how much of this is, is relationships and data gathering, how much of this is avoiding duplication, but still gathering information so that they can share that with the rest of us to, and then make recommendations for improvement. And I will say that I think that I do appreciate the point about training, though, because I think that's relevant. Mm -hmm. Because if you're going to have a public complaint process with respect to state agencies, there is an element of training so people know that that, that is available and how to use it. I also think we have a perfect model for justification by using the Vermont State Police process. They've actually seen the numbers go down because they're actually capturing data. They're making mm -hmm. changes. So you could use that to the data piece to justify why you would want this. Because it's already successful here. Why would you not copy that success and, and then duplicate that in other places? Um, I think that would be a good argument to justify that clearinghouse data capturing position because they want to see results, right? They're going to want to track results. 
Anything else? Yeah. Um, I'm missing a lot because I'm not. But it, it seems to me that one of the things that we're really talking about here, and it may not be yours, is a necessity for a, um, a triage office. Um, it's difficult to go to the local police and make a complaint. There's push, there's fear there, <clears throat> or any organization, and a referral from an office such as yours would have more force than a civilian's. It's a lot tougher to blow you off, and. Um, that's not just for police, but Gary knows, I think you would agree with me, yeah. it's tough, right? Yeah. So I guess, and I don't know where this will go, but I, I'm in my mind coming to, we need to suggest an overarching triage. It doesn't mean it's limited to that, but it would be something, if well publicized, that people would feel at least safe going to. And um, I think we've got a case down in the south of Vermont that uh, shows there was nowhere to go, or nowhere, no, no, there was nowhere to go. That's my two piece. And that, that could um, also serve as a data collection point as well, so you, you know, you're triaging, but you're also collecting that data on who's calling about what kinds of complaints and um by definition that's not the least. Okay. Again I just keep coming back to the effectiveness of the Human Rights Commission and have at times been really appreciative. And just trying to figure out how to support people in that in that full process, and really wanting people to succeed in that, and really liking what you're saying is that I know from my own personal experiences, trying to file a complaint against an agency that has harmed you is extremely difficult. And if um, there was that neutral sort of person, and then that, like, I agree with you, kicking something back out, this doesn't sound very nice, but I think that it eliminates that frustration because they're calling because you're an independent, safer entity. So it might be annoying if you then had to go checks and balances to do, like, your file to get the police, and they then you had to redirect them, but maybe there's also needs to be resources as an advocate within your organization that helps people guide them through that process, says, okay, we, we have to guide you through now the complaint process through the police. And that's what you have to do, to set them off on the right track, to set them off to be going forward, because these people are often not represented, they're often trying to figure out how to move forward with the complaint. So even though you spoke about a low bar, and I do know that is a pretty low bar, it's not a low bar for any of the other organizations, in my opinion, um, from my experiences and experiences of the people that I've been working with. So, it's a frustration that many people that I work with, I will refer them to the appropriate entity to file a complaint, and then if that doesn't work, I'll give them to you, and often it's, no, it's often, oh, they already exhausted it with them, or we have to wait for that, or there's no judge, it just goes around and around, and it would be great if there was some, an independent source. It would be great if that was documented, it would be great if data was used, just, and it would be great if there was somebody in-house that could help with that process and being able to follow through with those complaints against those agencies or those agencies to have an ombudsman or an advocate or a caseworker or a human um, resource, whatever that title may be, to help people through that process. And if we didn't want to do that collectively within our organizations, then centralizing that might be the other appropriate way to do that. Yeah. I just, I, again, I'm looking at the disability, and you all got that page in there. People with disabilities, and I'm not making an assumption of what those disabilities are, but again, when you are in trauma mode, it, you do not have to have a disability not to be able to function to get through the process. And so when you create all those other factors that people are living with, it is very, very hard. And 
I would like to get actual numbers of what people are experiencing and actual um, being able to actually um, solve those issues for them. Sort of an ombudsman. Yeah. I, that's the word I was person. using before, a couple of years ago. <laughs> I was like, oh, person. Person. <laughs> yeah. Karen, does any, does, does what Sheila's referencing, sort of this, this group of people, one person uh, linked up with HRC or not, does that ring familiar with anything you're seeing nationally anywhere with, that, with any similar situation? Um, here's how you, here's what we would claim. Here's walking them through, like a social right. worker we would call her right. in our world, right. right, to help right. navigate all the various systems. Right. Um, it does not sound familiar, but I'm not familiar. I mean, I could send out a kind of a blast email to other human rights commissions and see if any of them around the country have something like this or. It's almost like the victim's advocate. It's, mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we have that. I mean, I think part of what the Human Rights Commission has always been trying to do is walk that line between, um, you know, we are doing impartial investigations, so you need to be not seen as being, you know, weighted towards one side or the other, but it conflicts in not conflicts, but it's it's one charge and then you have the other, which is advocacy for civil and human rights, right? And, and trying to balance those two things and make sure that you don't end up with an agency where, you know, somebody who's a respondent feels they don't get a, a fair shake um, in how you structure it so that you don't end up, and if you had that kind of a position, you'd have to make sure that it was somehow so so totally separated from your enforcement division that you didn't, you know, that mm -hmm. that perception wasn't out there. Yeah, it's a, thank you. That's a really yeah. out there. So. Where do we go next? I have a sense, but I'm not. I want to hear from other people. I want to know if the community has any thoughts on what we're talking about. Okay. We, is, that, is that possible? Sure. In case? Because that might sure. help enrich our conversation. Yeah. Sure. I, I was just writing you time. I'm the community. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was connecting with you. Thank you. Because I just wrote a ton of notes. That, could I have my five minute comment now before we go on to something else? Oh. <laughs> this awesome. I was just writing a note. I could be subtle. But anyway, uh -huh. for those. <laughs> This is Ann Schroeder. I'm Ann Schroeder, and um, I'm with ACLU People Power in Wyndham County, um, and um, I want to thank Aton and Karen, especially for taking the time to email with me about an idea that I had. And I originally came up with this when I first saw Karen, and I don't know how helpful this is, but at least it's on this topic. Um, I, I came up with this when and Karen was saying how people don't know that they exist. And I came up to the last, was the meeting before last, with someone from the NAACP. He had no idea anything about the Human Rights Commission. Um, so I was thinking about this, and, and I thought, well, one way to make this complaint process uh, more available would be for the social justice organizations to actually link, have a link, perhaps, you know, preferably pretty obvious, yeah. on their Facebook pages, their home pages, um, and um, and then um, you know the, the various claim forms and um, and Karen has written me. I, I was very impressed. I didn't know you were leaving though. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so she really spent a lot of time emailing with me once I thought about this, um, and I did find one organization that's already doing this, um, which is the Workplace Fairness Vermont. And they are already linking to your whether you do that or not. I just have I did not. I just happened to stumble upon that, um, and it would seem now. Of course, this is going to increase the workload. <laughs> but if 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 people could see that right on their own organization's page, um, and I reached out to a couple people just to see what they thought. Um, so I reached out to Will Lambeck at Lambeck at Meyer Justice because I email with him periodically. Um, and he said he doesn't have an objection to that, and they may do it the next time um, that they do a website update. 
but in his experience, um, impacted people will generally not file a complaint without significant support from an attorney and or a community organization, which is exactly what you guys were talking about, that they, they, they wouldn't um, necessarily do that. And that's why this whole victim's advocate thing that you're talking about, this kind of advocate, having an advocate person that could help that person. And I'm guessing at, at Migrant Justice that they just don't have, I mean, that there's not much, um, I mean, I'm sure they would do what they could, but that's not their training. Um, and then I also reached out to the ACLU of Vermont, since I'm working with them. And they're on a whole different other angle of this. Um, and Kate Conazzo said um, she has no problem with this idea of linking to it in theory, um, but they would need to do some thinking about how, um, how they would do it because, and they have to speak to their legal team, because they already have existing ACLU complaint processes. So there's this two, these two kind of organizations that really have, some have perhaps nothing, um, you know, related to that, and there's some that would, it would just confuse the matter. Uh, but anyhow, that was my thought, and, um, you know, I just, um, I appreciated that Eitan and Karen were emailing me about it, whether that could work or not. Um, just thought I'd throw that out there. Oh. I was listed on the required posters that HR has to post that are kind of used as labor laws, and all kinds of the required to post certain things for employees to be able to see. Are you guys on that? We should be on it if um, for state government agencies. Well, I meant just in general because I know all employers have to post that for right. workers. I mean, regardless if you're right. federal or not. I mean, if not, maybe that's the thing that maybe it can be added. Right. You know, because those are mandatory to be put at all uh, places of employment. Yeah, there would be. At some point. Yeah, they would be directing people to us, and then we'd be referring them to the attorney general's office because if they're private, most of those are going to be private entities, okay. and then that's the attorney general's office. Okay, so it's only state, yes. Yeah. Or the EEOC. Okay. Um, it was just a thought. I just said. So I'm thinking here in talking about like thinking in terms of where to go next. <laughs> I should write something and y'all should tear it apart. I like um, that idea. And, uh, pardon? I like that idea. You like that idea? Yeah. Okay, I great. I, I, I you said you liked to write last time. Make yeah. so, yeah. I would make a motion that the... Uh, the Damn it, right. <laughs> make the chair work. Um, and what I have come up with so far, and I've like made a little diagram here, is Ken's idea of a position to come up with a robust complaint process. And, that, and then... Okay, I'm just going to say that. And then an ombuds person, triage person, and then whatever the HRC determines that it needs so that we're not in the position that has come up here of dictating to them what they need. But you're listening, obviously, to some of our concerns, so that may alter as a result of these kinds of conversations. And I feel like I should just sort of write that down on some level and send it out to you all, and we'll go from there. I have one additional, of course. Um, <laughs> um, of course. Of course. <laughs> um, so it's, um, sorry, I'm gonna change that. Um, it's because you're neat. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'll go on for a second, I'll, I'll remember in a second, go on. I've, I've lost my I was, I, I was, I was pretty much, I, I guess I just, I'm just sort of saying, I think that's where I should go, we should go next. Oh, I, mean, I remember now. Okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> now I remember. So, I, going back to saying again, thank you, well, you helped me remember, okay? Um, my job. Not about us without us, again, coining the disability community. I, I still would love to hear from the community. I'm wondering if before you have your grand final meeting, if you could have some time to look at the agenda and think about because we all talk about, you know, are these stories true? What is the community really thinking and feeling? And I'm not the voice of all Vermont's communities. I want to make that really clear. <laughs> and I know sometimes sitting here, it might sound that I think I might think that. <laughs> and so I want to make it really clear, I do not speak for everybody. I, there are plenty of maybe wonderful things that people have to say about our systems. I'm not sure what those are, but I'm sure that there's plenty of wonderful things that I do not speak for everybody. But I do have experience working with people and not about us without us. So I would love just like going back to your colleagues and being like, yo, really, what is going on? Really tell me how stressed out you've been. 
and really reflecting on how stressed out you've been and whether that even contributes to you not being there anymore and being able to do that job and understanding that you did say you need to split that and all of that, but really doing that and then having like a needs assessment of the Human Rights Commission because you're sort of asking, why is that? You, you would ask that at the beginning of this meeting. Well, why is that? And rather than I can tell you and I could, I could say that in different stories and different experiences I personally had, why not have a process on which people could give you that feedback in, in, a, in a constructive way to where they're not just saying, here's my concern or my complaint, but this is what I'd like to see. So maybe there's two questions of, this has been my concern, just too much time lapse in what you do, and I think you need more staff. So you allow them two options to be able to con uh, be able to say how they're feeling about the situation and also be able to give you feedback that can contribute to the development of what we're doing here. And I just think that's important moving forward because if we are creating structures for people without those people, it's not going to be the most effective it can be. So I appreciate your um, uh, volunteering the proposal to put something uh, in writing. I want to add, because I did appreciate Karen's point about restorative justice, and so I don't, I don't, I see that as part of what you've described, whether it's um, the uh, related to the ombudsperson or, or a, a person to just do this public complaint process, but I just want to say that I, as one member too, I mean, I think it'd be great to, for us as a panel to talk about uh, asking the commission to, in fact, implement a restorative justice approach. I'm just writing it. Okay, thank you. Got it. Anything else? That was great. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you, Karen. I, I hope we can. Don't go too soon. I mean, I I'm going to be around for another couple months. Okay, okay. Um, good. Because I think. We still want to pick. <laughs> pick away. Okay, great. And thank you so much. Well, Thanks thank for coming. Thank you. And, thank you for coming. Um, and anybody who has other thoughts, please feel free to just email me. It's very easy. Karen.richards at Vermont.gov. I know. Awesome. Yeah. So the report you were referencing, I guess, maybe you didn't have all the pages. <laughs> I'm, I'm She's going to send it to me and I'll send it. Yes, that was just a teaser. Okay. So. Thank you all for your hard work. I really appreciate everything yeah. that you all are doing. This stuff. Thank you, Kevin. Thank for you. Doing what you're doing. I'll be in touch. Okay. Thanks a lot. Okay. Um, reducing racial disparity in the criminal justice system. Everybody was reading their, their little part. I think the best way to proceed from this is to, I, I think we should just take where we are at the table and talk about what you read and David, make some notes. Okay. All right. Because I think that this is probably going to be best for people to talk about it right now and then re-digest it in written form. So I will get those minutes out as I try to do every time. And it, it, I'm sorry about this last one, but it was this horrible holiday, and it just messed me up. Um, and But getting that out to you as quickly as I possibly can, I think that'll allow us to make some determinations about the applicability of what's in that document and our work. Um, so, David, do you want to start? Because you were, you're sort of, representing judiciary matters. I mean, I wouldn't step on Judge Grierson's. No, no, I, I wouldn't either. <laughs> but the other thing is, I'm reluctant to keep tabling the damn thing. I, I just, I feel really badly about doing that. I mean, on the other hand, 
James Pepper was really clear that he had things he wanted to say about it, but he can't sit here tonight. Um, there's no way we're going to get through all of this. No, yes, time. there's no way so, we're going to yeah, through So it might just be initial reflections. But okay, yeah. that sounds like a plan. Right. <laughs> well, that's a good one. Yeah, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> sure, we can take <laughs> we'll take volunteers. Let's do that and just have some. Okay, I'll Lieutenant. Yeah. Yay! Woo! Thank, Thank you. you. So, yeah. <laughs> I did read through it, and uh, a lot of the things, the recommendations that they that they suggest in here, I, as an agency, we have already undertake a lot of that. Um, so I think what, looking big picture is the question or the charge that comes to us as an agency a lot, a lot is how to get other agencies to sort of pick this up in some way. Like how can we start to have sheriff's departments and local police agencies sort of tackle what recruiting and diversifying their ranks and making sure that's reflected in the community. And it, you know, as you start to think about that, that's, it's, it's, it's a huge, it's a cost, right? That's how mm -hmm. do we get outsiders outside of Vermont to come to Vermont and stay and apply for jobs and things like that and I think we're seeing that across the state and all different so that's a that's a big undertaking that I think ma many of us have to sort of tackle but a lot of the the training parts and uh, sort of cultural diversity and things we have offered out to agencies and you're part of that and Curtis Reed and others have helped us do that and go have that on a very regular basis happening through all of our recruit classes uh, those questions are put to our applicants, uh, diversity type questions and LGBT issue questions are put to the applicant. Before they even come in, we ask them what they'll bring in way of diversity to the state police because it's a priority to us. And when they sit in the hiring panel, those questions are put to them. So we're we've kind of having those scenario-based questions uh, uh, that, that can change up when we've got input from the community of what those questions should look like. Um, and then the training aspect, pushing it forward, what we do when they're, you know, at the beginning of the process, we have a very short sort of two-hour uh, implicit bias, cultural diversity training. Then at the end, we have a, a longer session, uh, which is a full day, where they're watching the documentary of the 13th and taking the Harvard implicit bias exam and things like that, reflecting on it and talking about it. And then ongoing, that all supervisors and um, evaluation process so we have a lot of these things that they're talking about in training and in implementation of how we evaluate an employee and whether they're staying on track and if they sort of go off the rails for lack of a better term we have a catch-all process in our evaluations it's a, a web-based system that will catch that so uh, that goes in line with our supervi you know, supervision and accountability um, so we're seeing that our supervisors are tracking their employee the sub subordinate putting it into writing, and if there's something happening there. So a lot of things they're talking about we're doing. How do we get other agencies to sort of pick that up? And I don't know what the, I, I don't have an answer on that yet, but um, we're, 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 I, we do outreach. Again, the community outreach part of that is sort of, we're doing a lot of that as an agency, and how do we get other agencies to sort of bite off that apple and join with us? And that's mm -hmm. sort of the challenge is when we, at, we put it out there, we get very minimal response back. So. It's yeah. frustrating in some sense, but we also are large enough as an agency to have the resources to do that. So I can see that a small, most of the agencies in Vermont are pretty small. And although they're probably doing community outreach, they don't necessarily document it in a way. You know, school resource officers and attending the local you know, harvest markets and things like that, that may not be accounted for in documentation, but are occurring. So, uh, and I don't know how we track that either. And, how do we make sure that that is actually happening in an effective way? So I, I think a lot of the points in there, we, we, I was able to check off on things that we do on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. So I, I was pretty happy with what I read and what we're doing. So I guess that's just a kickoff point. And there's other things, but I don't want to take up too much more time if anyone wants to ask questions or add up to that. Thank you. Others? Use his comments as like a you know <laughs> a well, template. I hesitate, especially because I would love to talk about the defense side of it together with, with you, Jess. But I did okay. skim the defense portion of this report to see what the recommendations and problems that have been identified from defense attorneys' perspective, implicit bias uh, in that, and and what struck me was that this sort of presented here 
multiple fronts, similar to what you were saying, an issue of, of training attorneys on how implicit bias uh, seeps into our individual representation of, of persons of color, and we don't even know it. So there's that level of training. There's also the substantive law training, which is going to the big, big issue, which is where do I de we identify inherent implicit racism at various critical points in the criminal and juvenile mm -hmm. justice system, whether it's from, and I'm talking about when the defense attorney gets involved in the, pro in, in the process, which is a time of initial appearance and bail decisions, and arguing bail and getting your clients released cognizance because we have these wonderful constitutional rights down to getting, you know, from the motions to suppress files based on allegations of, of uh, racial motivated traffic stops, right? And in there, there are legal standards embedded in traditional arguments that the reasonable person standard and training on arguing with the reasonable person standard, who is the reasonable person? You know, and pushing a doctrine of how that is been defaulting to sort of a male, um, white, the certain demographic. So training in terms of identifying training needs on the substantive areas where we can push as defense attorneys really innovative ways to interject and re-challenge old bad U.S. Supreme Court that has neutralized racism as being a legitimate and relevant factor in motions to suppress, in bail, in sentencing, and getting training on that point so that we can encourage more motion filings that then get the right preservation, that then continue the litigation through the appellate process and produce the decisions that change the, the criminal point. So that training point I saw here was really great, but that's a huge area, right? I mean, <laughs> each of these that they, they identify, recruitment, I mean, recruiting defense attorneys uh, any staff who want to work in our field is really, really difficult. Yeah. Now we take it to the point of recruiting uh, persons of color to fill our spots are even more challenging mm -hmm. because our salaries are so low, relative, right? The, the, um, right? Getting your family spot on for that match, the high costs of law schools make it that, you know, it's on and on and on. Um, the grueling nature of our work, uh, and so there's a high burnout, and, and, you know. So the recruitment issue and money involved with that. Um, was, was something I identified. Other things that, that, that this recommended uh, was more of pro approaching the legislature to change laws and increasing discovery, uh, increasing bail laws, um, sentencing reform. We are lucky to have a lot of that already on the books. A lot of it's about training and enforcing, right? Some of it we can tweak and have a very um, active legislative arm uh, advocating clients' interests during the legislative session. So there is always room for improvement. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I thought that that was good. Uh, I'll leave it there. I, I, I basically, my comment is I connected with it. I agree that we can see um, areas we can match up some of the recommendations with our needs. Oh, the only thing I wanted to add. Go ahead. Professional conduct. Um, board was, an issue, was a place of complaining, uh, implicit based racism and implicit bias of attorneys where people have complaints. Did it come up that we have a specific rule adopted last year, a year ago, last year, related to allegations of attorneys who engage in discrimination based on race? Did that come up? It's noteworthy because we're the only state in the country to have adopted this ABA model. It was just got uh, placed on my radar by uh, the Defender General when I brought to him this issue. And for everyone's references, it's uh, Rule of Professional Conduct 8.4 sheet. Which is interesting. Can you say that again? Yeah, yeah. Rules of Professional Conduct, uh, Rule 8.4, which governs all generally misconduct for attorneys, and then it's the last sub of G. So it is, a pro it is professional misconduct for a lawyer to engage in conduct related to the practice of law that the lawyer knows or reasonably should know is harassment or discrimination on the basis of race, color, sex, religion, national origin, ethnicity, and sex, place of birth, disability, age, sexual orientation. It goes on and on. So all the protected categories yeah. are within that. This paragraph does not limit the ability of a lawyer to accept a client.
final withdrawal from representation. Uh, that's not really relevant. This paragraph does not preclude legitimate advice or advocacy consistent with these rules. But what's noteworthy is that Vermont is the only state in the country, and it's adopted this ADA model of law, specific on our issues. Is that, I don't want to say anything like, is that like American Bar Association, like ADA? Oh yes, right, the American Bar Association yeah. right, recommended, and then it's up to the individual states to decide whether they want to adopt it. Vermont is the only state in the 50 states to have adopted So we got kicked out of 50 states and we're the only ones who did it. This particular one. Yay, Vermont. <laughs> now let's do it. <laughs> Thank you. That's very insightful information. Others, don't feel like your comments have to be flushed out. It's like we've got 12 minutes and <laughs> you know we're just starting this because I just don't want to completely let it go and table it again. That's all. I just want to keep this fresh. We've tabled it for three months. So there were lots of sections that related to my particular department because it was broken up into probation, parole and reentry. Right. Jail and incarceration, because most other states, those are separate systems, right? And in Vermont, you know, we're we're unique. There's a couple of other systems where they're. <laughs> no, I'm just laughing. We keep saying that. It's yeah, funny. well, it's true. But in most in most other states, you're going to find those things separated out across. The judiciary is going to run probation, right? And then you might have other people like sheriffs who are going to run county jails and then um, state organizations running prisons. And then you'll, you know, it, it's just, but in Vermont, it's unified, we're small, so we're, we're a system. So this report was written sort of with the rest of the country in mind and that they're all <laughs> operating different systems. And so it's slightly duplicative. It says some of the same things across all of them, which um, was fine. I still read as much of them as I could. Okay. Um, and so, uh, similar to what we're hearing already in terms of um, leadership and recruitment, that that was across all of them, and it makes sense, um, obviously, to think about recruiting um, uh, people, uh, diverse groups of people, and, and we certainly looked at that. And in some cases, for us. Um, that means women, quite honestly, mm -hmm. in a lot of cases, having women who are working in correctional facilities. And so that's one of the challenges that we're working on overall with diverse recruitment. And it does cost money, and it takes a lot of time. Um, that being said, it's something that we're identifying and working on mm -hmm. um, in, in our system. Some of the other things that I thought were interesting, uh, um, to um, Gary's point, is there are things that we're doing already. Um, that doesn't mean there's a, not a lot of things in here that we can improve on. Um, they talk a lot about risk assessments and using mm -hmm. risk tools and um, uh, developing graduated sanctions, particularly for um, people who are out on community supervision to reduce technical violations and returns to incarceration. And we have a whole grid of graduated sanctions that, that we apply and over the course of years we've actually seen um, change uh, because of that grid. Um, and we're constantly looking at that and, and revising that to make sure that it's appropriate. Um, there were some other things in there. Some of the things I talked about also were a lot about programming yeah. and how much programming uh, should be offered to someone once they come into a correctional uh, system. And, and that's also problematic for the reason a lot of other things are problematic is this, it costs a lot of of money and where the where the priority is going to be in terms of what type of programming should be administered. We have risk reduction programming. We've expanded our MAT treatment. You know, there's there's a lot that's going on. So it's, it's worth conversation around what what people are looking for in the correctional system as the priority for the for the resources that we have and how to how we want them to be distributed. One more point. Just put, yeah. It's about data too, which is yeah. something. And that's I was of, just going to go back. To, yeah. A lot, yeah, yeah, that is. It, it's really sort true. of, you know, yeah. as we've gone down this, oh, okay. as an agency, we've gone down this path for a long time now. And it's just as every layer pulls back another layer, and you right. realize how much further we can go. And um, we're working with other agencies to do it, but we're also seeing where there's so many points where that data gets, you know, those in, input points where it can be 
uh, people can have different ideas of how it should be entered and you know the decision making there of what that happens. So it's we're, we're constantly evolving and we're looking at our data and working on it and we're with corrections also understanding what that means where all these points are coming in. So I think we're seeing already a good sort of uh, groups working together to understand what the data means where as a person enters the system, where can we pick capture other points along the way. So I, I, that's something we're working on with other agencies. Yeah, and to and that was another point I wanted to make, I think on page 21 page numbers on the upper right. Weird. <laughs> anyway, um, it talks here about um, a five step process to look at the criminal justice system. And um, I know that the crime research group is working on a report um, because they're getting data from us to do this. Um, and they're pulling our data and data from across the system to really look at, I think, what they're, what they're talking about here is across this intercept system following people through the system and where people uh, come in and out, specifically with the lens um, of race in mind, so how they, how, how they want to look at that. They're just starting to work on it. I don't actually know when they expect the report to be completed. Uh, I know they don't have our data yet, so right. <laughs> I have to wait till they get it and analyze it. But that's, that's a pretty, I think that'll be really interesting for us to look at once, okay. when, once it's completed. You had mentioned, Lieutenant, about data uh, several meetings ago, and we were talking about that with you, David, about getting reports. Is that conversation germane to all of this? Yeah, I think that, I mean, that's what we're talking about, how we want to, the different agencies, if we're going to push into a triage point, I think we need to know what the scope of that's really going to okay. look at, what these different institutions that could be reporting in. Right. You know, all of a sudden that could be a massive amount of data that could be popped in or it could be a minimal amount. I just don't, we, we, don't, know. Know. we don't know. So we need to go back to a... And what agencies are going to... Right. What agencies do we want to think about as reporting in? Okay. Okay. I also think as part of this discovery that we're doing, I want to also give some kudos even to the corrections department because working with corrections a lot with inmates, um, they have a resource officer that if, if uh, say, a Native person or someone that has a certain religion that wants to use a certain item, they try to accommodate for them. But if they can't and they get denied, that gets bumped up to someone else who reviews that to say, well, is that okay or what was the deal? I, I mean, I know I talked I talk to Bob. And, Bob, right. And, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and uh, you know, that's why I say we also have to put in went on our report, I think, some things that are working that could be maybe emulated. Mm -hmm. Not just, this is from a cultural standpoint, but it could be looked at from a another aspect, too, where someone would be dedicated for <coughs> legal or complaints or something. But I'm saying from the spiritual end of things, you have something in place, um, which is a good thing. I mean, then maybe some of the other... Um, <coughs> Items that are overlooked could then model that as a, as something that's working. I, I don't know. I just want to at least yeah. throw that out there because I know it's always we don't want it to always be bad. But I mean, you guys are doing a good job when it comes to the cultural, or at least the spiritual resources. Thank you. So I'm gonna suggest that we pick this up at the beginning of next meeting and add the comments of James Pepper, who was very eager on the phone at about 5 o'clock this evening to um, add his thoughts to this. Um, so, sound good that we'll do that? I think this was a good start, but I, I'm, I'm a little like, it's a little anticlimactic. I'm kind of like, we're all getting going and like, eh, it's time to stop, because we have five minutes left. Um, Anne's had her five minutes. Thank you, <laughs> sir. I, I, you, you're no, you're I'm, not here to comment, are you? I'm not here to yeah. comment. <laughs> okay, I got that yeah, somehow mysteriously. Yeah, Mr. Okay, something you. Do my public radio. Hi. <laughs> um, so next meeting, and this is apparently this is an issue, correct, Monica? This is so the commissioner has a, has a conflict now on Tuesdays, and um, so we get you. 
You will, you will get me, except neither one of us can come on October 9th. And so someone from the department will come, and that's a, a said date, I'm guessing. Yeah, that, because yeah. we have a room. So some, someone from the department will come on October 9th. It, okay. If, if she can um, make some other arrangements, um, I will not be here. Okay. Um, but it, if it's possible to think about another day, and I, I, she didn't want me to suggest that that needed to happen, but... Um, Tuesdays will be hard. But it's going to be hard for her, yeah, so we might, we have to, I mean, we need Mondays to. are good days for her, so. Okay. That's, I'm just putting that out there, and that may be something to think about at the next. Well, and while we're collecting comments, I have received a comment from someone who has been trying to get here a few times, but has gone to the wrong location. Yeah. He's about one email back. Oh, uh, And so that's the, my the, fault. the request was, can we choose one place? Um, or somehow... To get here. And this was unpacking the salon. Well, and, uh, my understanding is if we choose, it, it's difficult to get rooms like this. Um, and that choosing one place is possible, but they may be in buildings that some members um, are uncomfortable with, and those would be governmental buildings. So. We, I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna, I'll put this on the agenda for next time, for, for an open discussion. Because um, we really don't have the time right now. We have three minutes before they have to close the building, and I'm sure everyone needs to use the washroom. What happened with the consistent meetings? Did something happen last time? Because that was like when I got the minutes, I was like, oh, we're meeting somewhere else, and now we're meeting somewhere else again. Like, it, like oh. They're just, yeah, just there's just lack of room. Secure, I, I mean, thought we secured it for the rest room. of the year. Yes, yeah. it's on the agenda. Yeah. We're going to Randall. The and, and, uh, sure. Sure. No, no, Randall. Yeah. So that's different. Right. Yeah, we've never been yeah. to start that. It's it's the only, I mean, Randall. Further down, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. 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 But yeah. it, it, I agree. We, 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 and it can be really. I think with I agree with you, and, no, it's not and it can be an advance notice um, if there's enough advance notice for people to really get this right. the public, and not just online, but through our minutes and for us to tell our people and whatever, and make it really public. Um, there is a um, there. There is an incentive to having it rotate around the state because it yes. allows it to access people from around the state that might not be able to travel as far. So you can look at that as yeah. a strength rather than a weakness and just really try to be really good with our communication while we're trying to figure out a stable location. Me. Be good with my communication. <laughs> yes. Sure, if that is on you, then yes. I think so. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, so that'll be on the agenda for next time, is to have that, that discussion. We won't, like, kill ourselves with it, but we'll, we'll definitely talk about it. Kimball Public Library in Randolph, 67 North Main Street, on the 9th of October from 6 to 8 p.m. Be there or be rhomboid. Tell your friends, family, etc. Pats. Um, new business, let's just leave it. Because I think we've got enough old business that if we have any more new, we're going to scream. <laughs> Anyone want to make a motion to adjourn? <laughs> Second. All in favor? Yeah. Aye. 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 Aye.